Just going down the list, I'm going to kind of ask people because either they're involved in it or their phase twos led to it. Um, let's go to Beth, which is a phase two, uh, the combination of uh, trastuzumab and bevacizumab uh, as adjuvant therapy. And uh, Mark Pegram actually did the first phase twos of this combination many, many years ago. Um, phase one and two. Phase one and two. And so what do you think? I can't comment on it directly, but I'm told that the phase three is negative. It's an adjuvant trial, phase three. Right. Um, so that's very disappointing. Though not surprising, given the lack of utility of adjuvant bevacizumab and other disease types, such as colorectal cancer, as you know, the CO7 trial presented a few years ago at ASCO, uh, similarly had negative results in colorectal cancer in the adjuvant setting, except during the one-year duration where they actually received the drug. Um, but uh, we might be seeing a similar problem with the BETH trial, that in the adjuvant setting, you don't have the issue of the uh, microenvironment and the high interstitial oncotic pressures, et cetera, that you have in a bulky solid tumor metastatic lesion uh, in a micrometastatic adjuvant lesion, and therefore those activities of bevacizumab may not be of any benefit. Um, but it is very disappointing. I mean, I was hopeful that perhaps this might resurrect bevacizumab in breast cancer, because for sure HER2 drives VEGF expression. That's been published by numerous groups, including our own. Um, and that relationship is unimpeachable. The other concern I have in the adjuvant BETH trial is that we also know that trastuzumab can decrease VEGF expression by itself, even in the absence of bevacizumab. So one wonders whether trastuzumab with chemo might be sufficient to decrease VEGF expression intrinsically in the adjuvant setting for micrometastasis, making bevacizumab redundant indeed. So those are some potential explanations for a negative BETH trial, but very disappointing uh, nevertheless. But intriguing, right? Intriguing. Patients intriguing. did very well, better than you predicted. Sure. So, Denise, do you have any comments on the Catherine study, which is actually just starting? So the Catherine study um, is following up uh, in, in looking at what we do with patients with residual disease in the HER2 setting. And I think that's a question all of us have. And when the patients come in after their uh, surgery, most of, the, most of the time we know beforehand, it's quite disappointing to uh, talk to them about their node positive um, disease or their uh, remaining tissue in their breast. And so I think this is a, a novel approach of trying to get around again that there's some degree of HER2 resistance or we need another way to approach those patients with um, novel drugs. So looking at TDM and looking at uh, that in that setting, I think, is, is an interesting focus. Uh, Kim, what about the NeoAlto? What do you think of Alto and NeoAlto, where those are going to go? Well, I think those are the ones we're all waiting to hear the results for. I think those will be practice-changing studies, both in the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting. I think given the recent neoadjuvant approval of pertuzumab, um, the reporting of the neo-alto long-term outcomes in terms of PFS and overall survival, hopefully will we'll even, even further reinforce this idea of using double HER2 block A with lopatinib and trastuzumab in the neo-alto study. Okay, and finally, Joyce, I know you've had a lot of interest in all these oral PI3 kinase inhibitors and uh, mTOR inhibitors, et cetera. What do you think about the combination of trastuzumab and some of these inhibitors? Where do you think those are going? I think that's what we really need. That's the thing that's not on the table right now. Um, Jose Bezeldo will probably update this, but he gave a talk at the IMPACT trial in Europe, and he looked at the NeoAlto and showed that in PIK3CA mutant patients, um, though they did better with the combination of the, of the trastuzumab and patent, it stay, still did a lot worse than those patients who had wild type of 3 ca And um, we have a small cohort, we'll probably put the data in for um, ASCO next year, 20, 25 patients who did not get PAP-CRs after preoperative trastuzumab chemotherapy, and there, you see a lot of PI3 kinase mutations in there. So I think that's the one thing, and whether it's gonna be an alpha-specific inhibitor or a pan-PI3 kinase, I don't think we know yet, but that's the, I think that's a really critical thing. That's what I'm, most needing in the clinic today, I would say, for the patients, and because they recur with metastatic disease and they still have these mutations that make them quite insensitive to things.